Hello everyone. Today I wanted to do a book review on an oldie but a goodie and this is Games Criminals Play How You Can Profit by Knowing Them and this is by Bud Allen and Diana Basta and this was first published in 1981. The Dead Sea of Israel is a body of water into which rivers flow and become trapped. The unusual landlocked lake takes but never gives, and because it never gives, its waters can't sustain life in any form. Still, it has the innocent look of being like any other body of water. Many travelers have been fooled into camping on its shores. They drink of its waters only to wither and die. Yet in that same area, there are lakes that accept and release the river waters. These lakes are teeming with life because they give as well as receive. Human life can be likened to the Dead Sea and its surrounding bodies of water. People who live rich, fulfilling lives give to their environment and their existence. They do not just take from it. Unless the cycle of give and take is completed within a human being, the result will be an arrested individual development. Growth within this person will still occur, but a portion of the mind becomes blocked and does not mature. Takers do know how to give, but their giving is always done with an ulterior motive. They only give for what they can get. People who develop a lifestyle of giving, but who are unable to receive, are very often found in mental institutions. People who take, but cannot or will not give, frequently live outside the law and are often found in prisons. Men or women in confinement who are trapped at the taking level of life usually continue the style by preying on institution employees. They develop intricate and sophisticated systems of deception, oftentimes for no other reason than the pleasure it provides them. Takers must gratify their senses, and the methods they create to receive this gratification are called setups. So why read this book? People heading for prison bring their survival trade of manipulation with them and adapt it to the prison environment. This book addresses the specific prison application of the process of deception that is little known to anyone outside of law enforcement and little understood by employees in the criminal justice system, even though they are the intended victims. In this book, the authors have isolated each step of the system used by convicted felons to coerce prison staff into breaking the law. They explain how to identify the applied technique, how to recognize patterned information being fed to them, and once recognized, how to prevent the process from maturing. And in the prologue, they give this real life example. The car leaned to the sound of screeching tires as Martha rounded the corner just blocks from the hospital where they had taken Joe. Her mind raced from one thought to another. Why would an inmate stab Joe? What could he have done to incite that kind of anger? Joe was a kind, considerate family man. He wouldn't intentionally hurt anyone, so why? Was there something he hadn't told her? Does Joe display one kind of personality at home and another on the job? There had been a change in Joe over the past few months. He seemed jumpy and restless. He had been leaving the house two hours early for work during the past few weeks. Could that have anything to do with the incident? Her mind pulled back to the day four years ago when Joe was first informed he was to report to work at a nearby prison. She remembered they joined hands and danced around the room, singing and laughing like a couple of youngsters on their first camping trip. Those were the happy times. Joe was realizing a lifelong dream. He had always wanted to be in law enforcement. Just think, she recalled him saying, I'm going to be a correctional officer. Her thoughts shifted again to how much Joe's personality had changed recently. They didn't talk to each other the way they used to. He snapped at the children, and now this. The doctor met Martha in the emergency waiting room. Joe will be all right, he said quickly. Only a slight chest wound, no vital organs damaged. He'll be home tomorrow. Martha slumped into a chair, sobbing with relief. Joe's captain had been standing nearby, and after Martha regained her composure, he touched her arm and said, I'm glad he's okay, Martha. They talked for a moment before seeing Joe. I'd ask Joe to get out of corrections if we were not so badly in debt, she told the captain. But if I know Joe, he'll be back at work before the week is out. Well, I'm not sure... Martha noticed an uneasiness as the captain responded to her comment. It bothered her, but she set it aside. Joe was more important. Joe had been home over two weeks now, and he gave no indication of when he planned to return to work. He seemed distant and deep in thought. Martha didn't want to push. After all, Joe had just been through something, but the debts. She would have to say something soon. 
It was Sunday. The children had gone out to play. Suddenly, Joe said, Martha, sit down. I need to talk to you. He was obviously worried. She had come to know that expression. It meant bad news. Bracing herself for the worst, Martha sat down. Honey, I've been fired. I no longer work for corrections. I was caught bringing marijuana to a prisoner. The words didn't come easily, but he went on with the story. I knew the institution investigator was suspicious of my actions and that if I didn't stop, he would find out what I was doing. So I told the inmate I would no longer bring things in, and he stabbed me. But why? Martha was confused. Joe had always respected the law. Strong principles, moral values, and honesty were all traits he exemplified. I don't understand, Joe. How could this happen to you? Joe continued talking. About eight months ago, an inmate with whom I had become quite friendly because he liked doing the things I do, told me his wife was going to divorce him. I knew something was wrong because his work was falling off and this fellow was the hardest worker assigned to my area. I felt sorry for him. He loved his wife and child and he didn't want to lose them. He knew I understood the agony he was going through, but it was different for him. He couldn't get out to see his wife. I felt an obligation to help him in some way because he kept me from getting into trouble with my sergeant. I had lost a set of security keys. He found them and returned them to me when I came on duty the next day. He ran quite a risk keeping those keys overnight. Inmates cannot have security keys in their possession, but he didn't want me to get into trouble. I respected him, and because I almost lost you, I understood his problem. Letters from his wife indicated that she still loved him, so he couldn't understand why the talk of divorce. He was emotionally drained. What made the situation worse is that his wife rents an apartment in town not too far from the prison and he couldn't contact her. Doesn't the institution have counselors to help people with their problems, Martha asked? I didn't stop to think about that, Martha. I was trying to help the inmate myself. It just seemed like it was my responsibility. I owed him a favor. At any rate, one evening he asked if I would visit his wife on my way home. He felt if his boss told her how hard he was trying to become a good citizen, she would reconsider the divorce. In view of what he'd done for me, I could hardly refuse, now could I? Joe continued talking without giving Martha a chance to respond. I stopped by the apartment that same evening. I told his wife how defenseless her husband felt. She cried, said she still loved him, and the only reason she wanted the divorce was because the baby was ill. She felt that by remarrying, she could get proper medical care for the child. I thought how terrible that a young, beautiful girl had to suffer this way. I wrote her a small check and told her I would drop by frequently to make sure that she was okay. She seemed grateful. I drove by almost nightly for a while, gave her several more small checks for medication, and she began to feel that life was worth living again. It made me good to think I was helping a young family in need. One evening she greeted me in her bathrobe and said she wasn't feeling well. We talked for a while. She went to get coffee and suddenly fainted. Her robe had fallen away, leaving her partially nude. I wrapped her arms around my neck, placed her on the bed, covered her, and called a doctor. He said she was okay, just exhausted. About a week later, her husband said, You've been visiting my wife a little too frequently. The two of you got something going on? He seemed irritated. I told him I was only trying to help, and he said, If you mean that, drop by my house tonight. My wife will give you a package containing marijuana. Bring it to me tomorrow. No way, I told him. But he handed me a letter saying, Read that. You've got no choice but to do as I tell you. The letter was addressed to the superintendent, and a copy was to go to you, Martha. It read, The officer whose name appears at the top of this document has been visiting my home and paying my wife for sexual favors. Enclosed were photostatic copies of my personal checks and a photograph of the inmate's wife with her arms around my neck, partially nude and fully awake. I have no idea who took the picture, nor did I realize the fainting spell was a fake. The inmate was right. I had no choice. I did what he told me to do. Since mankind first conceived of the idea of confining the seriously maladaptive personality in a secure detention facility, conflicts have existed between the people who command and the people who must obey. Failure to understand the underlying source of this conflict is a failure to recognize prisons for what they represent to the inmates and what they represent to the people who supervise inmates. Prisons are totalitarian communities. They are places where people are held against their will and forced to live with their controllers. They are communities where one is told when to retire, when to rise, what to wear, what to eat, what attitude to assume, and what is acceptable behavior. Once in prison, members of this society learn that by acting out, refusing to cooperate, circumventing rules, and being willing to do these things regardless of punishment, give them status among their peers. 
Viewing the dilemma of relationships from the vantage point of staff, prison employees are instructed that their duty is keeping felons confined for the protection of society. They are immediately trained to enforce rules, administer discipline, and control behavior. The custodial department strives to hire correctional personnel who possess a desire to help inmates find a better, more rewarding way of life. People inmates can emulate and learn acceptable habits from. People they can learn to respect and through whom they can find value in their own lives. Corrections also realizes that people who interact have an influence on each other. To guard against any negative outcomes of these interactions, the department has laid down some ground rules to assume positive outcomes. Employees must also live by additional rules in this confined society. Some of the rules direct employees to be friendly, but not overly familiar. To give or accept nothing to or from inmates unless authorized by the supervisor. To give advice when needed, but not to share personal data or information. These are just some of the rules, and to the uninitiated, they may seem trivial, but the rules were made to counteract the pitfalls employees may encounter. The inmates are not going to listen to someone unless there exists mutual respect. The inmates know the rules, in some cases, better than the employees. When an inmate breaks a rule, they expect the employee to follow the law enforcement continuum of crime, detection, apprehension, conviction, and punishment. The employee must follow this process to show the resident that they will not be allowed to get away with unacceptable behavior. Prisoners have no respect for staff members they can lower to their level of behavior. They do maintain respect for people who can continue to provide a high level of dignity and professionalism. Inmates want self-control that they can carry back with them to free society. For them, a good habit must be tried, then supported by the staff. An employee will follow a new behavior scheme of observation, recognition, prevention, treatment. This approach addresses behavior before, not after the fact, thereby making control and treatment easier for everyone with no one being caught out or embarrassed because no violation was committed. When an employee circumvents the rules, the prisoners lose respect for the person's ability to help them. The inmate and staff member lose any possibility of real rehabilitative interaction. The inmate figures that if an employee will give an inch, why not take a whole mile? This book explains the subtle ways the inmates test to see if they can extend the inch and gain peer status and contraband. It is hoped that by displaying the full scope of the process that prison employees or anyone else encountering this will recognize it in its infancy and put a stop to the nonsense. This critical examination of these controlling techniques cut through vain speculation. It reveals the subtlety of deception by providing a tool for recognizing and reckoning with these manipulative processes. The book presents models based on actual case histories. The purpose is to provide the realism necessary for critical examination so prison administrators and employees can effectively control illicit behavior before it proceeds to the point illustrated in the models. So let's talk terminology. A well-structured setup team encompasses, observes, contacts, runs, turns, and has point men, each with a specific task to perform. Observers. Inmate observers watch and listen to a potential victim. Observers pay particular attention to an employee who uses inmate jargon, ignores minor rule infractions, plays favorites, and are easily distracted. Two, contacts. Inmate contacts supply information about an employee. Inmates who overhear personal conversations between employees are good contacts. These people also ask subtle questions of any talkative staff members. Runners. Inmate runners are not active members of the total setup process, but assist in return for payment. Runners are usually the only ones paid because they must expose themselves to the employee by asking for items like cigarettes or by acting out small rules and fractions. Turners. Turners befriend employees and use that friendship to ultimately coerce the employee into engaging in infraction of the rules. This inmate will be the least suspected by the person to be victimized because the turner works very hard at establishing a close bond. Pointmen. Inmate pointmen stand guard when an employee is in the process of granting illegal favors, violating institution rules, or is being compromised or harmed. Trouble spot. 
Trouble spots are areas of job assignments where staff members have or can be turned into mules or pack horses. The techniques of a setup. The results of a careful, close, silent study by the inmate determines the likelihood of victim selection. So what are some of the things that determine victim selection? Body language. The manner in which correctional employees carry themselves give off messages. The astute onlooker wants to know if the employee is unsure, lacks confidence, has a dislike for the job, and a myriad of other personality traits. One's attire can also transmit body language messages. Unpressed clothing or open buttons can indicate sloppiness or be interpreted as inattention to detail. Listening observations. All my husband wants to do is sleep. This statement, jokingly and innocently, came out during a snack bar conversation with a friend. An inmate, in the process of delivering breakfast to the two women, construed the comment as a message to him of the woman's unhappiness at home, and he subsequently began hiding love notes under her plate. Some inmates demonstrate this egocentricity, and a particular inmate may believe that conversations contain hidden messages for him alone. Whether prison staff members like it or not, their conversations are constantly monitored. By not being aware of who is listening or how their words can be interpreted, staff may very well provide the foundation for selection as a setup victim. Verbal observation. Once theories and predictions have been established, preliminary testing must begin. A Turner will arrive on scene with several friendly inmates who confirm the Turner's validity and extol his virtues. The setup team needs to know how the employee gets along with the turner, and thus a conversation begins. He will like the things the employee likes and dislike the things the employee dislikes. Action observation. In verbal observation, the manipulator voices their intent to violate a rule to test the stand his victim will take. This action involves some risk on the inmate's part, but remember, the employee has been well observed and the violation will be extremely minor at first. For example, many institutions control housing area tier activity by permitting only the inmates living on a particular tier to be there. An inmate may ask an officer to briefly visit a friend on another tier. If the officer allows the rule violation, he has created a condition that would make rule enforcement difficult should the inmate decide to keep visiting his friend's tier. Selection of a victim. Victims of inmate manipulation are selected intentionally and accidentally. Intentional selection is when an inmate observer notices an employee who appears extroverted, friendly, or naive. A suspicion is born that presupposes a weakness in the individual. Although lack of experience and longevity on the job are not prerequisites for selection, statistically they prove helpful qualities. Accidental selection. In researching this phase of the setup process, the authors discovered cases where victim selection occurred because of an employee's change in job assignment. For example, an officer who spent six years supervising an inmate work crew made up of inmates about to be released was transferred to a different unit that housed hardcore felons, and his previous six years of working with prisoners on their best behavior had not equipped him for this setting. By doing favors for him, inmates noticed he felt obligated, and soon he succumbed to their demand to reciprocate. The officer eventually brought in marijuana and eventually lost his job. So now the book moves on to the tools of a setup. The steps presented in this section follow the typical sequence of their appearance in the setup process. However, they may proceed in any order as they are calculated to validate another step's credence. The support system. A series of phrases designed to befriend and develop a sense of togetherness and understanding sum up the inmate support system. The inmate attempts to create a friendship which makes inmate requests for favors difficult to refuse. Empathy and or sympathy. Empathy and sympathy are close associates but with one or two major differences. In empathy, one can understand and identify with a person's problems without feeling sorry for them. In sympathy, one cannot. The plea for help. In this phase of the setup process, inmates bank on the employee's need for ego fulfillment and closure. Employees want to know they perform well in a worthwhile job and like to see results. 
A carpenter can build a chair and admire his completed product, but correctional employees never see the successful completion of their work. They daily view their failures. Most correctional employees strive to help the inmate return to society as a good citizen. If they succeed, the person is never seen again. Prison employees, like anyone else, need to know their services have value. Because they rarely run into the positive result of their efforts, they are highly susceptible to the plea for help. A friend in need is a friend indeed, and inmates use and believe in this cliché. A friend will help another friend build a new life. Personal satisfaction and the feeling of a job well done bring the rewards. An inmate who has expressed faith in an employee will confess that he has been a failure all his life, that he lacks confidence and wishes to change his lifestyle. He will discuss family, religion, money, and elicit sympathy for a life gone awry. This is a delicate situation to handle. A sincere inmate must be helped. It is part of a correctional employee's job. How then can one be assured that an inmate is making an honest request as opposed to setting someone up? The truth is that no one can be assured that this is not a setup. But what an employee can do is test the inmate. The way to do this is to discuss the problem slash request with someone else and make sure the inmate knows that another person is aware of the request. The we, they syndrome. Recently, a prison staff member attended an after work hours party. Imbibing a bit too much, his conduct reached the realm of questionable demeanor. The following day, contacts overheard employees discussing the man's behavior using expressions like stupid, lacking in good judgment, and an alcoholic problem. Quite soon, the setup team members not only reported the derogatory comments to the employee, but also revealed the identity of the staff talkers. Then the inmate said, but they're wrong about you. They don't know you like we do. We know those things are not the real you. We don't feel that way. They are treating you just like they treat us. Hence the effective use of the we, they syndrome. The team wants to separate the victim from other staff so the victim will turn to inmates for ego support. They want the employees to think, I'm okay, you're okay, they're not okay. The controversial staff member took the bait and was caught in their net. He remarked to the employees, the sons of bitches talk about me all the time. Other people do the same thing. Why don't they ever talk about them? The situation provided the inmates with the foundation for a setup which eventually culminated in the staff person bringing in whiskey and later being escorted off the premises. Another example of the we they syndrome is an offer of protection where the offer is presented after instilling a sense of fear. In an area where an enclosure exists, inmates may point out to the victim how easy it would be for someone to force the employee into the forbidden spot and possibly harm or kill them. If the employee shows signs of fear, the inmate will rapidly assure them that they will not let anything happen to that employee. The victim employee is usually grateful for the concern and shows signs of willingness to become more friendly than before. If the employee appears to be overly unconcerned, the inmate then stages an event that dramatically demonstrates a need for inmate friendship and protection. This will occur when no other staff can witness the incident or assist the victim slash employee. Usually paid runners pose as assailants and the setup team members come to the rescue. The planned crisis is not designed to cause injury but is only to deepen the employee's concern about safety. Turners want victims to be grateful and feel a genuine need for their presence. Allusions to sex. Controlling the urge for sex in the prison community is now and always has been one of corrections greatest problems. Quite frequently, prisoners direct attention to staff members. In setup situations where the proposed victim is a female employee, the prisoner makes allusions to sex at any point in the setup process where he feels their friendship will tolerate such references. In the early stages, the prisoner directs his allusions to sex towards the employee but away from himself. For example, in a recent case, a prisoner said to a female correctional officer with whom he had established a friendship, Last night, while four of us guys were playing cards, one guy said if there was only you and him in the housing unit, you would freely have sex with him. I put him in his place, though. I told him you were not like that and to stop talking that way. The reference was directed away from the manipulator. Having made the statement, the prisoner promptly assures the victim that he put the over-inquisitive fellow in his place. 
The design of the illusion places the employee's anger, if any, away from the person revealing the conversation. The originator of the statement finds great importance in how the employee responds to the information because it determines the next step in the setup process. If she makes no comment at all, he assumes a freedom to make further allusions to sex. If her comment denotes a philosophical approach, such as when a man is in confinement, comments like that are common and expected, the inmate assumes the woman has a basic understanding of the needs of men in confinement and he feels safe in continuing the process. If her response requests further details, the inmate formulates the opinion that she anxiously advocates further discussion on sexual matters. But if her response is a cold and indifferent, such as, I need that inmate's name and number so I can report him to my supervisor, and if what you say is true, I will also arrange your work hours so that you are only here during the time others are present. I do not appreciate talk like that, nor do I appreciate hearing about it. Her reaction will have the effect of closing the subject. Depending on how much inmates have invested in the setup process, her response can also conclude further attempts at manipulation. In cases where the inmate sees the victim as responding in a positive manner, his allusions to sex will eventually be directed less and less out there and more and more toward himself as the person in need of attention. The touch system. Inmates create touching situations with both male and female staff members, but may do so more with females. Touching of male employees usually consists of a handshaking, pats on the back, or placing a hand on the shoulder to form a closer bond. The touching of females must be less obvious with greater caution exercised. This could be flicking a speck of dust from the clothing or straightening of a blouse or a coat. The touching grows more frequent. If the female staff member registers no complaint, an accident will occur where the inmate will trip and in an attempt to regain his footing, touches the female employee's breast. This inmate will apologize profusely, but allows a period of time to pass to see if the employee reports the incident. If she does not, the touching will get more aggressive. The rumor clinic. The rumor can effectively detach a staff member from their peers. A well-placed rumor will create doubts in the minds of everyone. The setup team will begin the rumors in an area of the facility that is away from the victim's work area. Peer attitude toward the victim slash employee changes as the force of the rumor intensifies. People like to go with a winner. True or not, a bad rumor makes the employee a loser. The employee whom the rumors are about feels isolated. This provides an opportunity for the setup team to strengthen the bonds of friendship. This phase of the setup can also reintroduce the offer of protection. Turnouts. The term turnout has several meanings in prison, and one of them refers to employees of a correctional facility who have been successfully coerced into supplying prisoners with illegal contraband. For the inmate, this is the point of no return. Turning a person out cannot be accomplished without breaking the law. Before taking this step, the inmate must be confident that the setup has been properly administered and the person being turned out can be controlled. The shopping list. Acquiring contraband was the entire reason the inmates conceived the setup in the first place. The shopping list demands for male employees consists usually of drugs, alcohol, money, weapons, and on a few occasions, homosexual acts. For female victims, the request is almost always sex first, then drugs, alcohol, or money. The lever. A lever will pry or force an object to respond through the proper distribution of pressure. If the inmate has done their job properly, enough pressure has been applied to force a prison employee into breaking the law. If the employee meets the shopping list of demands, the lever is never mentioned. But if the employee refuses, the inmate reminds the victim of their earlier indiscretion, aka the lever, and threatens exposure if compliance is not forthcoming. In the cases that follow, the creation and use of a lever are clearly shown. Officer Fredericks was a man of extraordinary loquacity. I think I pronounced that right. His constant running conversations were largely ignored until an inmate observer began noticing Fredericks grew even more talkative when prisoners living in his unit approached him with their personal problems. The inmate surmised that the officer's loquaciousness was a shield masking emotions the man had different difficulty controlling. Credence for this theory gained confirmation when the inmate observer witnessed Fredericks granting favors to emotionally charged
discharged prisoners because he felt sorry for them. On the basis of these observations, inmates selected him as a victim for manipulation. A team formed and established a system of praise and pleas for help. And when a rumor developed suggesting that Fredericks had been stealing state equipment for use in his home, they protected his reputation. A testing situation occurred when the chosen Turner, whose wife had just passed away, asked Fredericks to hide a sympathy card addressed to the deceased woman's parents in his lunchbox and mail it when he got to town. There was nothing wrong with the card, so he mailed it, creation of a lever. Inmates continued their praise and especially complimented Fredericks for mailing the card they had all signed. This small act gave a great deal of comfort to the inmate husband of the deceased. Sometime later, the inmate widower developed a cold. The hospital medication did not seem to work, so he said to the officer, my eyes water from this cold and I can't study for school. My grades are not too good and if I flunk, I won't get my parole. Then I won't be able to care for my kids because I'll be stuck here. A Vicks inhaler would stop the congestion and the inmate store doesn't sell them. I will never ask for anything, but being with my kids is important to me. Fredericks, being a family man, understood the importance of children having a father, especially since the mother had recently passed away. It only cost 89 cents, so why not? This was the creation of a second lever. The following day, his inmate friends approached and told him a package containing marijuana would be dropped at his home and he had to smuggle it into the institution for them. At first, he refused. That is, until the inmate widower stepped forward and said, look sucker, you ain't got no choice. I got the Vicks inhaler you brought in and evidence showing you took a letter out for me. I got your job. Now, if you don't do as you're told, we're going to kill you you're as good as dead. Fredericks was caught bringing in the marijuana and his employment was terminated. The investigation that followed showed the inmate's wife had not died and he did not have any children. In the aforementioned case of Officer Fredericks, the officer knew the inmates had something on him, but since it generated out of a friendly, concerned gesture, he erroneously did not believe they would hold it over his head. In the next case, because of his lack of consistency and lack of control, the officer did not even know the inmates had a lever on him. Inmates first took notice of this officer when he disciplined one inmate for not cleaning his room, but permitted his orderly to leave his living quarters unattended. This inconsistency in the enforcement of rules told inmates that, given proper conditions, the officer would circumvent institution regulations. A team of inmates not assigned to his area volunteered to work for him, stating they just wanted to keep busy. They worked hard, did an excellent job, and cultivated the officer's friendship. They even got themselves transferred into his area. They knew the officer would find it hard to say no when a small, seemingly unimportant rules were violated, such as allowing their friends into his area who had no business being there. The setup team employed runners to act unruly in his area. The officer allowed, and he was grateful for his helper's control of the disruptive situation. The officer and his select inmate friends formed a closer bond. As the minor disturbances continued, his inmates told him they intended to keep troublemakers in line to make living conditions more tolerable by just pushing a guy around a little. The officer looked the other way. Actually, the inmate victim was badly beaten and then raped by six people. Soon, the inmates requested a gun. The officer turned them in, but it was too late. The lever they had acquired involved forcible rape, and there were no officer reports. When the officer reported the gun episode, a large number of inmates exposed him, saying he knew of the rape case all along. The evidence presented against him caused his termination of employment. So this book has many more real life examples and case studies of correctional officers who were turned out or coerced into doing inmates favors, bringing in contraband, providing sex. And it also has a Q&A situation with actual answers for you of how to handle questions inmates might ask, um, incidents that might occur. So first it asks you the questions and then you go and read the answers of how to correctly handle each situation. And it also deals with how to handle backlash if an employee was caught up in the setup process but pulled out before crossing the line and doing anything illegal. So I feel that this is an important book. Almost daily, one reads in the newspapers of various scams perpetrated on the American public. This is a unique book 
in that no one has ever revealed this before, the anatomy or structure of setups or criminal plots. The cases in this book are not only informative, but they are intensely interesting. They are. They, they picked some very good cases to include in this book. This is a book not only for correctional officers, but every American to read. Only by knowing how to recognize these schemes devised by criminals both inside and outside of prisons can a man or woman protect themselves from possible great losses, even, lose, <clears throat> even losing one's entire savings. It could save your fortune, even your life. Um, and they do have an incident or a story at the end of the book involving, I think, el someone elderly and a con artist. So I don't know if they threw that in there to round it out, but I thought it was a nice way to finish the book. So questions about this book, comments below. I think this is a book worth reading, especially if you work in the correctional facilities. It That is a hard environment to be in and getting to know the process of how people can manipulate you is always valuable and it's a good tool to have so that you can recognize it if it's happening to you or if it's happening to someone you work with, someone you care about, etc, etc. All right, that is my book review for this week. If there is a book you would like to see me review, leave me a comment down below. Otherwise, as always, thank you for watching and I will see you in the next review.